All right, everyone, I decided to do my presentation on the Kama Sutra of Vatsyana and Diotima's speech with Socrates uh, in Plato's Symposium. The reason why that I wanted to do this presentation is because the, the relations are, are very similar between these two pieces of uh, ancient literature, and, and its relevance is not only for its own time period, but in the modern world today. So the Kama Sutra of Vatsyana is basically a manual guide for how to be the perfect lover and how to perfect the art of pleasure, not only in giving it, but in receiving it as well. And Vatsyana is the person who wrote it, he, uh, amongst with other people, um, but the reason why he decided to kind of undertake this voyage of writing this book is because it hadn't really been talked about before. You know, sex was kind of something that had always been, you know, kept in the bedroom and and so for him to bring it out into the light, I mean, even for today's standards, it's still such a bold text um, that has, you know, amazing descriptions on how to perfect the art of being a lover. And so Socrates' conversation with Diotima um, starts first of all in Plato's Symposium, it's a group of men that get together and they all kind of pay their respects to the god of love and they describe the god of love and who he is and, and what is he of and what is he like. And Socrates isn't satisfied with any of these men's accounts of love and so he, when it's his turn to speak he recalls a woman, uh, a priest named Diotima and her account of love and who love is and what love is. And later he goes on to describe what, she, what we call Diotima's Ladder, um, which has very important concepts on, you know, how love evolves um, within us. So Diotima states that love is not a god, but a spirit, which we can agree has an energy to it, if, if we say. And it was born of poverty, which is the mother, and resource, which is the father. And it's those ideas which explain the following concept, that love is always poor and without, and it constantly need, needs and does not always receive, such as people choosing not to love somebody. But love is resourceful, and so the spirit can always manifest himself into love of anything, such as, for example, my love of eating dried spaghetti noodles, which nobody else seems to love as much as I do. But keeping in mind that love requires resources, we must also account for the fact that resources are impermanent and such is the nature of love that when a resource is depleted, there is no longer a vessel which love can fill. And so love is always in need of permanence or so that it's its desire. And the Kama Sutra attempts to remedy this impermanent nature of love by allowing a malleable vessel or resource which can change in accordance with what is needed to allow love's continual stay. And it's for this reason that the Kama Sutra urges that we open our hearts to our lover and study their pleasures and know our own pleasures so that the love energy can last in an eternal sort of way. So for example, uh, the 64 arts would take a lifetime to perfect. It's, a, uh, it's a kind of like a, there's a list in the Kama Sutra if you read it. and It's a bunch of different things that you can do to to be the perfect lover, um, such as like keeping your nails reasonably um, trimmed and cleaned. Um, it talks about how often to bathe, what oils and fragrances to apply when and where. And so this image is a man who's, you know, obviously taking care of himself and, and you know, he's practicing the Kama Sutra in this sort of way. And just as these women here preparing themselves. So the Kama Sutra is a manual for how to make yourself the perfect vessel for eternal love by becoming the perfect lover. And you can see that there's incense being burned underneath that shawl to make it smell nice. There's flowers and a mirror and that woman's having her feet massaged. Um, there's sweets and the beds being made in the background. So it's in this way that the idea of sustaining love plays into Diotima's idea of love's function is giving birth in beauty, both in mind and in body, and that giving birth is the attempt for lovers to be immortal and to thus allow love to be immortal. So if there's constantly a body for love to possess, 
then love cannot die. And I really liked this image uh, for, you know, it's showing that there's both creation happening and, you know, a woman who is already created. So it's like the birth of beauty and the creation of beauty. It's happening simultaneously. Diotima does not mention love to be of one person to, um, exclusively, but actually the contrary. So in Diotima's ladder, love of a single body, such as, you know, a love of a mother when we're first born, is actually the lowest rung on the ladder for its very nature that it acknowledges a sort of ignorance. Because to love one body, you have to admit that all bodies look similar. Therefore, you know, there's actually a love for all bodies which we hold. And to choose one and to deny the others is a form of ignorance. And that... And the Kama Sutra itself is no stranger to the idea of love of many bodies. And though Vatsyana focuses on love between two lovers for the sake of the book and, and its practices, the entire book focuses on how to woo any body we find beautiful, even if we are married or poor. And Vatsyana does not deny that this, this love for all bodies. And some of the 16th century sculptures and, or, and paintings inspired by the Kama Sutra show women partaking in pleasing up to in pleasing up to five men at once or a courtesan who courtesans who please each other when the king is away or the married man spying on his wife with her sisters as they bathe and to limit love to a single body is to guarantee its end but as we know once we have allowed ourselves to be possessed and blessed by love's energy we wish it to last forever The third rung on Diotima's ladder is the, is the love of beauty of minds, and the Kama Sutra is no stranger to this concept either. Indeed, the Kama Sutra states in regards to choosing a wife that she should be well-learned, curious, able to speak of important issues with clarity, then enchant those listening. Just as a man should show temperance, be a gentleman, and have other qualities which we all consider to be beautiful. And I really like this image for emphasizing that because it's a man who, uh, this is actually Krishna, um, and he's combing his wife's hair. Her name is Radha. And, I mean, you can tell, like, this is not out of necessity that he's doing this. He's doing this because he's gentle, because he loves her, because this is, this is how you be a lover to, to the person you love. So I think where the Kama Sutra and Diyatima start to differ is here, in that Diotima states that regard beauty of minds as more valuable than that of the body, so that if someone has good of the mind, even if he has little of the bloom of beauty, he will be, he will be content with him and will love and care for him and give birth to the kinds of discourse that help young men to become better. As a result, he will be forced to observe the beauty and practices and laws and to see that every type of beauty is closely related to every other so that he will regard beauty of the body as something petty. The Kama Sutra believes that while one is young, practices of Kama should be applied sufficiently so that one honors love in all its forms. Only when one is older should one make the time for revelation and connection of concepts from one's life. The connection of all things being a form of beauty is not required for one seeking to perfect themselves as a lover of bodies and souls. And actually, the Kama Sutra, in a way, incorporates all of the Yatima's um, rungs of the ladder kind of in, in the form of loving another person. So finally, the fourth rung um, on Diotima's ladder states that one should have a realization of all things being beautiful so that there is a general beauty to life rather than an individual instance of beauty. And Diotima dares to acknowledge that one will no longer be slavishly attached to, all, to the beauty of a boy or of any particular person at all, or a specific practice. Instead of this low and small-minded slavery, he will be turned towards the great sea of beauty, and gazing on it, he'll give birth, through a boundless love of knowledge, to many beautiful and magnificent discourses and ideas. But Vatsyana states very clearly that the pursuit of 
eternal love through bodies and souls is not to be done out of selfish desire, such as what Diotima would say loving bodies is. Rather, the Kama Sutra attempts to combine the love of a body during the time of coition with the love of all bodies in a spiritual sense. A love of beautiful minds, practices, learning, and finally arriving at beauty itself as the ultimate form. And I like this image as a means to describe that because it shows here these two lovers um, on a horse and the woman is holding on to the man as he kills his this wild beast, and you can see there's a, a ring around them of glowing light showing that they're in complete spiritual union with each other while this is taking place. And so it, it's just, like, encompasses, like, everything for me, the highest form of love. So to sum up kind of the relation between the Kama Sutra and Diyantima's ladder, it looks a little bit like this. So... Out of all the beautiful bodies, one is chosen, one whose majority of characteristics are beautiful. And secondly, that the single body is wooed through intelligent conversation, philosophical ideas, religious devotion, and more, so that the beautiful person is loved equally for their beautiful mind. And when coition begins, and the two engage in sexual forms which enhance love energy, they love the forms, the learning of the form, you know, the learning of the, the sexual uh, forms and positions, as well as like the knowledge of the forms. You have to read and memorize and know how to do them so that you can transition smoothly. And they share in this mutual love uh, that they have learned and the beauty that arises from it, which is, you know, amazing love that's being created. And uh, when the question ceases, you know, after the peak of sexual experience has been achieved, they share in an afterglow in which all beautiful things become one, and it can be acknowledged that there is a general beauty to everything, that beauty itself is prevalent in all things, and that it is not these things such as, you know, incense and shawls and, and betel nut, which is a, a food that they eat, and uh, sex. They don't define beauty, but that beauty is the energy which animates and livens all things. And I, I like this image because it shows these two lovers, um, you know, maybe they finish sex, maybe they're still, you know, kind of involved with each other, but they're in this most beautiful environment. You can see birds flying in the background and these gorgeous flowering trees and, you know, they're, they're adorned with beautiful things themselves and it's just everything is kind of like merged into this one just you know, all things are beautiful, and they're just sharing in that with this experience and realizing that in this experience. Now, making love in the Kama Sutra harnesses the love of beauty by going through the very steps which Diotima describes to Socrates in Plato's Symposium. And actually, there's a, book, a movie called The Kama Sutra, a Tale of Love, which I highly encourage you guys to watch if, if you want, you know, a, a visual summary of the Kama Sutra because you don't want to read it. It's, it's kind of a long and boring book. Um, but this movie literally has everything, every concept in the book almost um, tied in somehow in some way. And so to conclude, if I may assert, uh, the Kama Sutra is if it's implemented in its truest form, one may find beauty of all things spiritually, which can enlighten us and catalyze progress of making the world a more peaceful place. Thank you.